Now the DNA has exonerated more than 230 men, mostly in sex crimes and murder cases. Criminologists have been able to go back and study what went wrong in those investigations. What they've honed in on is faulty eyewitness testimony. Over 75% of these innocent men were convicted in part because an eyewitness fingered the wrong person. At the heart of the problem is the fragility of memory. As one researcher told us, we now know that memory is not like a videotape recorder. You don't just record an event and play it back. Instead, memory is malleable, full of holes, easily contaminated and susceptible to suggestion, as in the case of Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton. Before this case, did you think that there were a lot of innocent people put away? No. You didn't? No, I didn't. Innocent people aren't convicted of crimes they didn't commit. I, I believed that. What do you think now? Oh, I know better. I mean, well over 200 cases nationally. We've had a half a dozen in this state alone. The first, of course, was my case. Hallelujah! And as these innocent men have been freed in one state after the next, we've learned something else, that in all the cases where eyewitnesses were wrong, the real perpetrator was not in the initial lineup. When you're sitting in front of a photo lineup, you just assume one of these guys is the suspect. It's my job to find it. And Jennifer did her job. She found the suspect's photo. Problem is, the suspect, Ronald Cotton, was not the rapist. Bobby Poole's photograph was not in the photo lineup. Right. He was not in the physical lineup. When the real perpetrator is not in the set, is, is none of them, uh, witnesses have a very difficult time being able to recognize that. Gary Wells, a professor of psychology at Iowa State University, has been studying eyewitness memory for 30 years. He says when the real guy isn't there, witnesses tend to pick the person who looks most like him. I think that Ronald Cotton and Bobby Poole look very much alike. They have very similar lips shape of their eyes, their eyebrows kind of go up in a look of surprise. Yes. yes. Without him in the lineup, Ronald Cotton was the one who was in jeopardy. Well says eyewitness testimony has two key properties. One, it's often unreliable, and two, it is highly persuasive to jurors. I can see why it's so persuasive. Someone says, I was there. You'd believe that person. You believe that person because they have no reason to lie. Yeah. The legal system is set up to kind of sort between liars and truth tellers, and, and it's actually pretty good at that. But when someone is genuinely mistaken, the legal system doesn't really know uh, how to deal with that, and we're talking about a genuine error here. He walked us through what went wrong, some of it counterintuitive. When Jennifer spent five minutes studying the photographs, she and Detective Galden thought she was being careful. I didn't want to come across, I don't think, as somebody who was like, that's the one. I really wanted to be sure. Well says no good. Recognition memory is actually uh, quite rapid. So we find in our studies, for example, that if somebody's taking longer than 10, 15 seconds, it's quite likely that they're doing something other than just using uh, a reliable recognition memory. So you're saying if she really recognized a guy, it would have been almost instantaneous? Quite quick, yes. He says a better way would have been to show Jennifer lineup photos or people one at a time so that she would compare each one directly to her memory rather than to one another. Well, Wells showed me a study in which more than 300 happen. subjects were shown deliberately uh, shaky uh, videotape of a simulated crime. You look out a window and you see some suspicious behavior. What happens is we tell them later then this person that you saw right there mm -hmm. put a bomb down, that, uh, down the air shaft there. Then subjects are shown a lineup and asked to identify the bomber. That would be so hard. And Very I difficult. just saw it. And, uh, of course, you're particularly cautious right now. You know now, after we've talked, probably not to pick anyone. <laughs> no, no, actually. I, know, I actually know who it is because yeah. if I had yeah. who is come it? upon that, I think it's this guy. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? Yeah. You're I'm wrong? wrong? Yeah. Okay, so there you go. And I'm already saying how hard it is. It's none of them. It's none and of it's them. And it's so... It, it, it's so <gasps> And you Isn't know about that bizarre? it. bizarre? You know about this. We've talked about this. So, so this is the difficult. This is what that, makes it so difficult. Look what you just did to me. Yeah. 
I'm mortified. I feel like Jennifer. Well says in real life, the mistake is often compounded by what happens next. Remember the seemingly innocent information Jennifer says she got from police after she picked Ronald Cotton out of the physical lineup? That's the same person you picked out in the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, bingo, I did it right. Well studied what that reinforcement does. After half his subjects did what I did, picked an innocent person from this lineup, he told them nothing, then asked them questions about what they had seen. Very few felt highly confident about their choice. Only about 4% are saying they had a great view, which is good because we gave them a lousy view. Only about 3% are saying they make out details of the face. That also is good because they, they really couldn't. But he told a second group of subjects, after they made the same incorrect choices, good, you pick the suspect. Now what happens is oh uh, 40, uh, almost 45% of witnesses now report that they were positive or nearly positive. Notice that over one-fourth of them now say they had a great view. And <laughs> this is really what happened to Jennifer. It is what happened yeah. with Jennifer. What this seems to be saying is that a reinforcement alters memory. It does. Dramatically. It does. He says the solution is to have someone independent administer the lineup, someone who doesn't even know who the suspect is, and certainly not the detective on the case. You I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been there. No. But nobody did anything wrong. I mean, that well, was no, the Well, no, that practice. was the common practice yeah. then. It was, it was the tradition. It was how it was done then. Law enforcement wasn't schooled in memory. We weren't schooled in protecting memory, treating it like a crime scene, where you're very careful, methodical about what you do and how you use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't, we weren't taught that in those days. But none of these errors explains perhaps the most puzzling part of this story, how it is that Jennifer could see Bobby Poole in the courtroom and not realize her mistake. You're looking into the face of the man who raped you, whose face you had studied so intently, yes. and there's no flicker, nothing, nothing between you and, and Bobby Poole. Nothing. Nothing. And I've gone back there many times trying to think, was there? Was there ever a moment? Did I ever look at him and think, <gasps> and I didn't. Elizabeth Loftus is a professor of psychology and law at the University of California, Irvine, and an expert in memory. She showed me an experiment she says might help explain Jennifer's mistake. She asked me to study these faces. Then, after a few minutes, she gave me a memory test. Which of these two faces do you recognize? Right. Okay, you picked right. Left. You picked left. Okay. And I said left, but I wasn't 100% sure. And then, the tricky part. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I'm stymied. Because I just picked this one on the left two seconds ago. But now I'm not sure, because those two look very much alike to me. But I'm going to tell you the left. But I was wrong. It was the one on the right. Loftus explained how I had been duped. You saw this face. Then I gave you a test where I presented you with an oh. altered face, oh my God. along with a novel one. So I pretty much induce you to pick a wrong face oh. because I don't even have the real guy there. It's an altered version. And later on, when you now have a choice between the altered one and the real one, you stuck with your altered left yeah. choice. This is exactly what happened to Jennifer. This can help us understand why Jennifer can be sitting in a courtroom mm -hmm. and be looking at Bobby Poole, the original rapist, and looking at Ronald Cotton and saying, saying, no, it's not Poole, it's Cotton, because she has been picking him yeah. all along. I begin to wonder whether there should ever be eyewitness <laughs> testimony in uh, trials well, because of the tricks that memory plays. Yeah. I, I think what's important, though, is, is to understand that, know that. Know it as a police officer, as an investigator, uh, as, as attorneys. We need eyewitnesses. I mean, if we couldn't convict based on um, an eyewitness, that's giving a lot of comfort to criminals. We have no choice. We have to find ways to make this evidence 
uh, better. And that's something Jennifer has tried to do ever since, by telling her story to prosecutors, police, defense attorneys. And she's had some success. Her state, North Carolina, was the first in the country to mandate reforms by law showing victims lineup photos one at a time and emphasizing that the right answer may be none of the above. Having lineups conducted by a person who doesn't know who the suspect is, or not by a person at all. The person who committed the crime may or may not be included. One system, now used in a handful of cities, is computer software Mike Galden helped develop to have a laptop conduct photo lineups. Does this person look familiar to you? But yeah. law professor Rich Rosen says that in the vast majority of places, there's been no reform, and that needs to change. This is something that police officers can and should be in favor of. Because you're, you're not getting the real guy off the street. Yeah. Bobby Poole raped other women because they went after Ron Cotton. So mm. Ron is not the only person who suffered from this mistake. Ronald Cotton, now 47 years old, has worked hard to rebuild his life. He works the late shift in a factory. He's been married for 12 years and has a 10-year-old daughter. They live in a house paid for with money Let North Carolina paid him in restitution, $10,000 for each of the 11 Let years he spent in prison. When he can, he joins Jennifer in her campaign for reforms. One of the most amazing things to have come out of this miscarriage of justice is the most unlikely of friendships. Jennifer and Ron say they speak on the phone about once a week. They're families of friends. They say they have a shared bond that is hard for most people to fathom. Have people ever met you for the first time when you're together and said kind of cheerily, hey, how did you two meet? Yeah. yeah. They we have. did it on the yeah. airplane a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're traveling. And I usually just go, you tell them. <laughs> well, what you do know. you say? We would look at each other and laugh, you know, and finally we go ahead and... And tell them. Mm -hmm. And they have recently co-authored a book in hopes that their story can inform and inspire others. Today, when you think about what happened to you that night when you were 22 years old, whose face is there? Nobody's. Oh my, that's, that's, that to me is one of the most beautiful things, is I don't have a face. Hmm. Bobby Poole's dead. I don't ever have to worry about him ever hurt another woman. He died in prison. And Ronald Cotton is my friend. For more on how memories can be contaminated, go to 60minutes.com.